Hello and welcome to another episode of Terribly Drawn History. Today, we are going to be discussing the evolution of firearms. This is a very detailed path and takes place over about 400 years. With these 400 years, we would see a great shift from arquebuses and hand cannons used by the early Chinese and later the Europeans to the self-loading and semi-automatic rifles of the First and Second World War. The hand cannon, which was first seen in China around the 13th century, would be the first true firearm. It had the simplest firing method, and it was easy to construct. All it took was a metal tube with a wooden stock. Powder would be poured down the barrel, and so would the projectile, which would often be stones, metal balls, anything that was could be used to damage the enemy. Then, one person would often hold the gun and steady it, while another person would light it. Sometimes even a bipod was used so that the first person could fire it on his own. The arquebus was a smoothbore firearm. Since rifling had not been invented yet, when the projectile was fired, it would often bounce around inside the barrel. It was also a matchlock firearm, which meant that a long rope was lit and put to a firing pan where it would ignite the black powder and create an explosion. The arquebus is a broad term that encompasses earlier hand cannons, but they were slightly bigger. Soon, the arquebus bore would be a standardized shape so it could be loaded easier, as well as make the bullet making process easier. The early matchlock consisted of two parts, a smoldering rope and a firing pan with powder. The trigger puts fire to the powder and then creates an explosion, like I said previously. This was very dangerous, however, but the weapon could now be fired easier than the hand cannon. Oftentimes, the arquebus was inaccurate, and it was simply used as a show of force against enemy armies, as when it was first invented, many believed that this was some type of foreign magic. Although some arquebuses used the matchlock system, it was still fairly new and unperfected. The heavy arquebus, or musket, would be introduced as a standardized matchlock weapon with a longer barrel. With the matchlock rifle came line fighting, which is the most effective way to fire these weapons. The matchlock rifle is credited to Portuguese innovation, whereas with the arquebus, it would often take two people to fire this weapon, or a bipod. One person could now fire it alone, with the mechanism lighting it, the pan for them. Although most muskets were still smooth bore, which rendered the shot inaccurate, some began to be rifled. These were grooves drilled into the inside of the barrel to put a perfect rotation on the bullet. Similar to its later counterpart, the flintlock mechanism, the wheel lock would incorporate a spinning metal cylinder that would ignite gunpowder. It was seen from the 1500s, and we can still see its mechanism used today, like modern lighters. Although wheel locks would be replaced, they would still be common in weapons like dueling pistols. Although wheel locks had a better firing mechanism than the matchlock rifles, they would be very expensive to produce and would often be reserved to nobles and aristocrats. Introduced in the early 17th century, the flintlock musket would replace a lit rope with flint and steel to create a spark to ignite the same powder used in the matchlock rifle. This would cut down reload times and make the musketeer a faster shot. This weapon would drastically change European warfare forever. The flintlock rifle would see use for the next 200 years. Next up is the spinning cylinder. Although these were not new, when cartridges were invented around the early 1800s, the spinning cylinder was able to be used more effectively. A pin would be located between the hammer and the cartridge that would strike the brass or the cartridge firing the bullet and spin the chamber in the process. A push rod would disperse the spent cartridge. The first modern revolver was made by Smith and Wesson in 1837 and was commonly seen throughout the Civil War. Also introduced around the early 1800s, the percussion cap would be the new system used on rifles. Along with the cap came more standardized rifling and the introduction of cartridges. The cap was single use, but easy to replace, as well as being able to create a spark in bad weather like rain, where the musket and the matchlock could not. Inside the cap was a small pressurized explosive that would ignite the gunpowder, and new standardized bullets known as the mini ball would make these firearms even deadlier. They would see wide use throughout the Civil War, as many of these new firearms would. At the same time that the famous breech loaders were being perfected, the lever action rifle would be introduced. The lever would allow the gun to be reloaded from underneath, and would also allow the use of rapid fire clips or magazines. The levers, being locked, would prime an internal hammer that would strike the metal cartridge. It would widely be adopted during the Civil War and after. They would still see use along bolt actions and self-loading rifles, 
but would eventually fall out of favor among militaries. Up until the late 19th century, almost every firearm had been muzzle-loaded. With the advent of metal cartridges, this would change with the introduction of this mechanism. This cut down reload time drastically, as no longer did the gun need to be unaimed to be fired. The fully metal cartridge would also allow this gun to see wide use. There were several early forms of breech loading, most notably in cannons. However, the bolt-action breech, which was introduced to rifles, allowed for quick firing and sealing of breeches. Most were single shot, but eventually, magazines were introduced. The last major firearm we are going to talk about is the gas-operated self-loading rifle. Almost every firearm to this day copies the gas-loading mechanism. It was developed during the First World War, but was perfected during the Second. The rifle would use the gas discharged by the previous shot to load the next bullet in the magazine. All the shooter had to do was relax the trigger and to reset the internal hammer, resulting in rapid fire. Firearms after this would greatly copy this method. Whether it was submachine guns, automatic shotguns, or automatic sniper rifles, almost every gun would now be gas-powered and semi-automatic in some way. Thank you so much. This has been another episode of Terribly Drawn History. We'd like to turn this into a mini-series. So if you want to see the history of the machine gun, the submachine gun, the assault rifle, etc., please let us know in the comments. We really want to make this something the community can help us with. Thank you so much. Have a good day.